Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. I am excited to be here with Michelle Patinato, and we are going to talk about mixing and EQ. I love this subject because when I was learning how to record from home, I was super frustrated with learning how to mix correctly, learning how to EQ. And I am excited to what I can learn from Michelle today. So I know that you guys are going to learn a ton. So before we get into that, I would love to know, Michelle, like some of your background, how you got you know, started working with in the sound area and how you started working specifically teaching people how to do EQ. All right. Well, um, hi, Brie. And first, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so I've been a professional sound engineer for 30 years. And a few of the artists I've worked for are Gwen Stefani, Adam Lambert, Goo Goo Dolls, Melissa Etheridge, Styx, Jewel, Indigo Girls, Kesha, Thievery Corporation, um, and Elvis Costello right up until COVID. Uh, that was my most recent tour. We were in the UK on tour in March when COVID hit and the industry shut down. <laughs> so, um, But I, I started working in live sound in the late 1980s. And at the time, there were very few women in the field. Um, my first tour was in 1992 with the band Spin Doctors, if you can remember them. Oh, absolutely. Um, I remember them. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was just before they broke. Um, I got hired and, and the timing was perfect. You know, I, a uh, month after I started working for them, their album hit the Billboard Top 100 and it just kept climbing. Um, so it was really, you know, it was a great experience to be part of that. Um, and that was actually the start of my professional touring career as a concert sound engineer. And I never looked back. It's, um, it's really been the best job in the world. Um, for the most of the past 30 years, I've, I spent an average of 250 to 280 days a year on tour, traveling the world, mixing great music. I mean, oh my it doesn't gosh, really get any an, better than that. <laughs> that's an insane schedule though. How did, did you yeah. ever feel like super road weary? Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I definitely have have times where I'm like, you know, after a tour, I like, okay, I know I'm burnt out. I need a couple, you know, months off here to, to just kind of recharge and give my ears a rest. And, um, but uh, yeah, there's been, you know, for the most part, the, the breaks, you know, it's not 280 days straight, like there'll be breaks in between, but, um, and, and that seems to, to work well. There's been a couple of years though, where um, there was a point where for five years, I was just working really hard and, and really, you know, solid for most of that time. And by the end of that, I just, I had to take a couple months off. I was kind of just gone, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. So then uh, in, in 2012, um, I co-founded an organization, soundgirls.org, which was to empire, empower and inspire the next generation of women in audio. Um, oh, I'm so glad you're going to talk about that because I love Sound Girls. When I first heard about it, I thought it was amazing um, and it aligns so much with a lot of things that I do. And uh, like just the whole idea of like there aren't a lot of women working in sound. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always been a male dominated industry and um, you know, and, and it's like, I personally, for me, that's never been an issue. You know, I, I love working with men and, and women, and I've been on both sides where I've been the only female on the tour. And then I've been on tours where we had more women than men. So, you know, it, it's, I personally have had a positive experience throughout my career, but I know women who've had very opposite experiences. So you know, Sound Girls was a way to like, I, it all came about purely um, by coincidence. You know, I had been looking for a way to show young women that you don't have to be a guy to do this, you know, that you don't have to be a guy to be an audio engineer or work in music production. Anyone can do it. And in 2012, um, myself and four other female sound engineers were on a panel at the Audio Engineering Society. And all of us had more than 20 years experience at this point 
we're, you know, we're at the top of our field and yet only two of us had known each other. Um, myself and Carrie Kies, who is the monitor engineer for Pearl Jam. And she's also the co-founder of Sound Girls. But Carrie and I had started out at the same time in the late 80s. And we'd both known of each other throughout our whole careers because it was like, oh, do you know the other woman, you know, <laughs> doing live sound? But in, in 20 plus years, we had never crossed paths, which is crazy because it's such a small industry. So this panel was all of women in live sound. And when we all met, it was one of those things where, you know, we were all at the top of our field. We have, you know, Jerry Palumbo, who is a broadcasting engineer, does the Super Bowl, NASCAR, NFL. Um, Claudia Englehart, who is, you know, works with jazz great Bill Frizzell, has been with him for 30 years. You know, we're just kind of like, how is it that none of us know each other? How could we not have met or even heard of each other before this? And we just had such a great experience. Like we really bonded through that. And shortly afterwards, Carrie kind of reached out, you know, and, and brought up the fact that how would our lives or our careers have been different if we had each other as a support group, you know, from when we started, like through our entire careers, how, you know, there's, there's things that women have to deal with in life and in, in touring that men don't. And it just to have another woman who understands what you're going through and what you're dealing with, how much easier would it have been? So that's kind of where, you know, it, it her and I started talking and that was like where Sound Girls was born. Mm. And, and how many, how many girls are women are in that organization now? Oh God, it's, I think it's out around 6,000, but so the, cool. uh, yeah. And it's worldwide and it's, it's expanded to, um, you know, we started out cause our experience is in live sound, but it it's blossomed to mastering, recording, engineering, musicians, songwriters. Um, it's open to anyone and it's, it, you know, membership is free. And um, there's even, you know, men who are, are supportive of women in the industry who belong. And it's just such a great organization because there's so many fantastic resources available. Um, you know, there's always scholarships for people who are trying to get education and, and learn, you know, whether it's audio, songwriting, music production, you know, um, there's, there's just, it's, it's just grown beyond anything we had ever imagined. It's, it's really fantastic. Mm, that's, that's so awesome. So, so once you started that, you were still doing live sound? Yeah. Um, I was, I think I was on tour with Melissa Etheridge mm. um, around that time. Uh, but yeah, it, it was crazy. Cause when it, we started, it was just Carrie and I doing everything. And, and, you know, it's built, it's, you know, we built a website, we built the, it's, you know, getting um, people to, uh, to blog for us. Cause we started with um, what we did originally was, and we still do um, every month we wanted to feature a, a woman sound engineer um, cause it's kind of bringing the face of women who do this to young women. Cause it's that kind of that thinking of, you can't be what you can't see. Yep. So when young women go to concerts or, um, you know, all they see are men doing this, they think, well, I can't do that. That's not for me. So we wanted to kind of highlight some of the careers of some incredibly successful women, like Leslie Ann Jones from Skywalker sound for one. And, um, you know, people like that, who've kind of been, you know, under the radar and not given the proper due and respect, um, as their male counterparts have. So every month we would feature an in-depth profile on another woman, um, in audio or music production and kind of focusing specifically on, their story, like how they got to where they are and what lessons they've learned and what advice they can give because everyone has a different path into this industry and there's so much to learn. You know, there is no one way to make it, you know, whether you're a musician or a tech, you know, to get on tour, to get a hit record, to build a following, there's, everybody's kind of got to find their own way. And so we kind of wanted to, in doing these profiles, we, we pull a lot of specific questions like what are the lessons that you've learned? You know, what were the biggest hurdles that you faced and how did you how did you meet them so that these young women who are getting started can pull all of that knowledge and experience, you know, to kind of make fewer mistakes and, and get a little bit of a, a break, you know, make, you know, make it a little easier for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I love that, you know, they're getting to see others that are doing this. Cause I did actually at one point when I was younger, think I might go into sound field. And at the same time I was an artist and everywhere I went, it was always males working mm -hmm. in sound. And so I just, it just, you know, I kind of just put it out of my mind, like, Oh, girls don't do this, you know? Right. Yeah. 
And, and that's the thing, like, so, you know, we, with that, we did the profiles. We also had women blogging from um, all different areas of the industry. So just those two things alone is, is a huge resource. Plus there's a private Facebook group um, where uh, people can, um, you know, post, uh, you know, anything from, Hey, I'm moving to LA and I, I need a room. Uh, I'm looking for a, a place to stay and for job, you know, postings or, Hey, I, I've got this problem with this piece of gear. Does anybody know how to fix it? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's just such an incredible resource and it's free, which is the best thing. That's, that's super yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, so as far as your career after that, you continue to do live sound. And when did you get into kind of teaching this stuff to other people? Well, yeah. So over the years, um, I've, I've done a lot of mentoring and speaking to students at Full Sail and other universities and conferences. And and then through Sound Girls, just from meeting so many aspiring sound engineers and musicians and producers, I started to hear a lot of the same questions. You know, oh, my God, there's so much to learn. What do I need to know? And, and, and where do you start? And how do you even get started? And I also saw a lot of the same problems. You know, people were struggling to create great sounding mixes um, because they they lacked, uh, you know, some of the basic principles. Um, and and that led me to creating and launching mixingmusiclive.com in 2019. So I, it's just a place for me to pass on the knowledge and experience that I've gained over the past 30 years of working in audio. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy to be self-taught these days. You know, when, when I started out, you either had to be lucky enough to find someone who would take you under their wing and, and teach you what they knew or go to a school. And, and there were very few schools at the time, you know, like I went to Full Sail in um, the 80s. And before I went to Full Sail, I also went to a place called the Recording Workshop. And, you know, aside from those two, there was Berkeley and I think, Musicians Institute and maybe like one other place that were were well known. Now there's, you know, almost, you know, any school has some sort of audio or music production program. Right. But, you know, it's you can also like you have so many resources available to learn on your own right now. But the thing is, you kind of have to be careful who you're learning from. You know, um, anybody can can put a video on YouTube and and say, oh, I'm going to teach you how to do this. But it's also, well, what are the, what's their background? What, you know, what exactly do they know and have they done? Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that's kind of where Mixing Music Live came from. Um, I, a friend of mine had been prodding me for years. It's like, you should teach, you know, you should teach audio. You should, you should teach live sound. And especially to the local people here, because nobody knows what they're doing. And I, you know, I'm like, well, I can't really do that when I'm not home. <laughs> but I started to see, you know, a lot of the same mistakes being made because people, you know, we're learning on, on, you know, Googling, how do I do this? How do I learn this? Um, And they weren't getting the right information. And I started to look at like, well, the information, there's a lot of information out there for free. And some of it is very good. And some of it is very wrong. And some of it is very incomplete. So that led me to create my first course, which was Mixing Music Live, which is an intro to live sound and mixing. And, um, you know, it, I launched that in 2019 in the summer and um, through that, it's been a great experience, just kind of um, meeting, not, not necessarily virtually meeting, virtually meeting the people, the students who have taken the course and, and seeing them progress from, you know, different people who had been in audio for maybe 10 years, but really didn't know the basics to people who were just starting out and didn't know where to start. And, um, watching them go through it and hearing their stories afterwards, you know, like I just got my first gig and, you know, getting emails from them about how great it went because they, they know more now, they know what they need to know when before they were just kind of fumbling around. So that led me to um, creating a, a, a new course. Basically when COVID shut the industry down this year in March, I um, decided to release a second course, which teaches musicians how to create great sounding mixes with nothing more than simple EQ techniques. And that came about from listening to my musician friends just struggling with trying to create professional mixes of their songs. And a lot of them think that they need to spend a ton of money on expensive gear and boatloads of plugins to enhance their mix when all they really need is a little EQ. But a lot of musicians, in, you know, they think EQ is this mysterious and complicated thing and that only sound engineers and producers know how to use it. 
And a lot of them are also tired of paying someone else to mix their songs and, and fix their mixes. And, and some musicians don't even have the budget for that. So they're putting out a lower quality product just because they are lacking a few simple techniques and skills. Well, and not and, only that, but I think some of them are going to a studio or somebody that is saying, oh yeah, I know how to record, I know how to mix. And what they're coming out with is not anything better. <laughs> than what they right. do at home. Because I've had people submitting music to me for Women of Substance and I write back to them and I say like, this isn't quite up to our production standards. And they're like, but I went to a studio. I had a, you know, an engineer mixed this. And I'm like, well, then you, you know, were charged for something that was not good enough quality. Right. And that's the thing, like, you know, the, the, the musicians who don't really have the budget to hire a, a real professional engineer, they'll find somebody, oh, I'll mix your song for 50 bucks. Well, it's likely that the person mixing it for 50 bucks isn't going to do any better of a job than you could have done on your own. And, and that's kind of a bummer because, you know, musicians, it's, you know, when you're, when you're starting out and you're an indie musician and you're struggling to, to kind of build a following, every dollar counts, you know, um, unless you're lucky enough to have an unlimited budget, but a lot of people don't. And I, I see so many people wasting money on, on expensive gear and, and things that they don't really need just because they lack the, the techniques and the skills. And, um, you know, even, even in live sound, like I've seen uh, young sound engineers buying every plugin available and mm -hmm. not using anything on the actual consoles. Like I, I mix with nothing more th than what's on the console. I don't use plugins. I don't use racks of outboard gear. I, I use my sound, mic, you know, my sound console and, and that's it. And the right microphone wow. and, and, you know, proper gain structure and EQ and, and that's all you really need. So through all that, um, you know, I, I remembered how, when I first started out doing audio that, you know, even with a, a good education, you know, putting theory into practice is a whole different thing. And when I first started mixing, like I knew what EQ was, but I really didn't know how to use it. And I didn't know how I was supposed to EQ instruments and what things were supposed to actually sound like. Mm. Um, you know, I had a few, I was lucky enough that I had a few really good teachers, but it, it still took a lot of trial and error. And eventually what I realized is that EQ is easy for the most part. It's a simple booster cut. Um, it's not that complicated, but the hard part is knowing what things are supposed to sound like mm. and knowing the frequencies. And that's where most people struggle. So I came up with a three-step process that breaks it down into um, three simple steps. And it's called the, hear, the HIT production process, which stands for hear, identify, and tweak. And with that process, you first learn how to hear the way a producer or engineer hears. And then you learn how to identify frequencies. And then finally, you learn how to tweak those frequencies with EQ to get the results you want. And this, I, I think, kind of pulls it all together to make EQ make sense for people. And they, they realize it's not this big technical thing. It's actually just listening, you know. Yeah, I realized recently how powerful EQ is because I just got a pair of AirPods and they have that transparency mode. And I, you know, I was listening to like the difference between that and the regular mode. I'm like, I think all they're doing is cutting some frequencies so that you can hear people talking, you know, while you're listening. And right. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much what they're doing. I'm like, that's, it's amazing what you can do by just cutting frequencies and raising frequencies. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's a, you know, a huge thing for, you know, a lot of musicians, one, and even sound engineers, like one thing they, they struggle with is how do I get clarity between all of the different instruments? Like my mix is kind mm -hmm. of mud and, and you can't yeah. really hear, you know, the definition. And it's just simply with EQ, you know, you, you carve out notches um, in, in specific instruments for space to open up for other instruments to shine through. And that's just, you know, simple EQ techniques. Mm, and yeah, that's really, really cool. So if you do EQ right, then is, is mixing like the next step of mixing? Is there actually anything to do? Like, what do you do after EQ? Well, you know, like mixing, it starts with, I mean, it's, it actually starts before you get to the, the DAW or the, you know, it, it that that's, it starts with, you know, the, the right mic choice and mic mm -hmm. placement and then getting proper signal level. But after signal, once you've got good signal level, you, you want to EQ. Um, and then, um, then it's balancing of 
of your your actual input levels you know all of the different instruments and vocals it's just creating the balance but eq is is part of that you know when you're find that oh my guitar and my keyboard and my vocal are all kind of competing for the same frequency space i'll use a little eq to notch out a frequency on the keyboard to let the guitar come through and i'll notch out a frequency on the guitar to let the vocal come through so that's all part of the the balancing of those sounds um and and really i mean technically that's all you really need um a lot of people make the mistake of trying to use tons and tons of compression mm -hmm. when mixing like i've had someone ask that's me that's what like, i oh, know i did <laughs> Yeah. And, and I, I actually had somebody ask me the other day, well, how, how do I, I, I need to know how to set up the compressor for each channel. I'm like, you should never be compressing each channel. <laughs> you know, Com compression is kind of like, you know, the icing on the cake. It's, it's like it comes afterwards, you know, it, it, originally compression is, is, you know, can be used creatively and it can be used, you know, um, constructively. And mainly it, what we use compression for is to control the dynamics of the signal. You know, if you've got a, a singer who's, who sings really quietly and then really mm -hmm. goes into wailing, you know, and there's a huge dynamic range difference, you want to compress that a little bit so it doesn't end up clipping or distorting. Um, you know, some instruments, you might have a keyboard player and between patches, they're wildly different levels. So a compressor is used to kind of control that. Um, but when you add too much compression to a mix, you end up just squashing the life out of it and you end yeah. up with a dull, um, boring, flat sounding mix. Um, so at the end, you know, a little compression overall over the entire mix can actually help. Um, but it's again, it's not necessary. So let me ask this question because if you compression also kind of happens during mastering, do you really need to do any compression during mixing if you're going to master? Um, other than some individual inputs uh, to you know to just get more of a balanced signal, um, if I would you know leave it your overall mix, I would leave for the mastering because once you do it on the overall mix and you send it to a master, they can't remove it. That's true. Yeah. Mm, that's good to know. Yeah, I think I think making these distinctions is helpful for people, at least I know in my audience who have a lot of questions about they don't even quite understand what mastering is and how it's different from mixing mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I have a question because I, you know, when I would perform, um, this is why EQ seemed so like lofty to me when I would perform with this this group back in the day. Um, and, you know, some of the people in our group would do the sound. And they would set everything up and they'd be like, okay, now we need to EQ the room. And they would do this like thing, it was, whoosh, you know, and it would like EQ the room. And it was almost like they did this like magic thing. And then all of a sudden now it's going to sound better because we EQ'd the room. So how is it different EQing live versus EQing when you're, you know, recording? Um, that's a good question. And, you know, the EQ, it works the same both in the studio and in live, but there are some minor differences. And I actually do explain all this in the course. Um, mm. You know, when there's one, one specific thing is when you're, when you're mixing, um, I tell you, like one of the things I, I one of the lessons of, of the proper way to EQ is that you want to EQ your individual inputs first and then EQ your entire mix. And you might not need to even add any EQ to the entire mix, but you want to make sure you in EQ all the individual instruments and vocals to they sound the best and they sound the way you want them to sound before you apply overall any overall EQ. Um, now in live sound, you still follow that, except the first thing you want to do before you EQ anything is EQ the room, which is basically EQing the, the PA to work with the acoustics of the room. Mm. And that is done by inserting a, a special EQ over the, the sound systems that you can use to, we call it ringing out the PA. So any frequencies in, that are inherent in the PA, maybe it's a bit honky sounding and you want to smooth that out, or maybe there's frequencies rolling around in the room, you know, like low mids or something that are just kind of, you, you hear those frequencies building up. You get rid of that with the EQ that you use on the PA. And then you will start with EQing your, your individual inputs and then finally your overall mix if you need to do anything. Um, but the thing with, with EQing the PA is it's kind of like if you were painting a picture and you start it with a, a really tattered, dirty canvas, and you might paint a beautiful picture, but it's still gonna be kind of tattered and dirty. Whereas if you start with a beautiful, clean canvas, then you're gonna have a much prettier picture. And that's essentially what EQing the PA is doing. It's giving you that beautiful, clean canvas to start with. 
Ugh, that analogy makes so much sense to me. Um, thank you for that. This is like a question I've had for literally like 30 years. So, <laughs> so glad you answered this question for me. Um, yeah. That's really, really cool. And the fact that you have knowledge of live sound and doing it recording wise. And I know that, you know, with, with COVID and everything, people have been doing so much recording at home. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's talk about like, why is it important that they have a really good mix even if they're just, you know, going to release it to their fans or they're going to send it to, you know, as a demo or something like that, or try to get a sync placement. Why is a, a good mix that includes correct EQing important? Yeah. And, and that's just so hugely important. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize, um, you know, there is so much competition out there. You know, um, and, and the days, uh, even if you're just a singer songwriter recording demos that you're trying to to pitch, um, the, the people that are getting your demos, they're not just getting yours, they're getting demos from thousands of people, the people who are getting your sync, your, you know, songs for sync placement, they're getting thousands a day. And the reality is, when they start to listen to it, if it doesn't sound great, in the first couple seconds, it's going in the trash. They don't have time to listen to all that. So you got to get them right from the start. And if the mix is muddy or, or clouded or just not good, it's going, you know, they want almost a finished product when they're getting it. And even if you're just releasing music online to your, your fans or to, you know, Spotify or SoundCloud, again, there's so much competition for people's listening, you know, uh, attention. There's people are being bombarded constantly with watch this, listen to this. So if you're scrolling through Spotify and you start to listen to a song, if it doesn't sound good, it could still be the greatest song in the world. But if it sounds bad, you're going to either maybe listen to it once and move on and forget about it, or you're not even going to finish listening to it. So the whole thing is it's, it's the whole package. You know, it's the great song and a great professional sounding mix that makes people have a much more pleasurable listening experience. And then they come back and they want more and they tell people about it like, hey, you got to listen to this track. So it's all part of the picture. Yeah, I know for me as a reviewer, like, first of all, it's a first impression thing. And right. it makes me, you know, already judge the song. I mean, you know, I hate to say this because I'm a musician and I, I hate to tell you that this happens. But after so many years, you know, it just automatically happens that you make a judgment within the first mm -hmm. 20 seconds. Um, but then also it, it distracts me from being able to listen to the good parts distracts yeah. me from listening to the lyrics. It distracts me from listening to the singer. All I can think of is I'm hearing, you know, pops in their microphone or I'm hearing, you know, weird, like muddy bass or, you know, the, yep. the drums are like, like too tinny and it's distracting me from hearing the rest of the song. Yeah. And that's the thing, like the people who you're giving this music to, their ears are so trained and all of that stuff just jumps out and, and it's, it's hard to get past it. Um, even, you know, even just the general audience. Um, I, I've known a few artists that are, are, they're well known, you know, they, they've been around for a few years and they've been releasing music on their own from the home studio. And there's, one artist in particular, I, I love her. I love her music, but I cannot listen to her records because there's so much distortion on them. Mm -hmm. And whether it's just, they were, I don't, I, you know, first record, I thought, well, maybe they were just doing it as an effect, you know, to, to enhance how powerful of a singer she is. But then the second record came out and there is again, just clearly they, someone, whoever is, is recording this doesn't understand that they're overloading the mic preamp and it's distortion and it's it's not real loud but it's there and it drives me crazy and it just bums me out because I love this artist but I can't listen to her music <laughs> and, you know and and that's a thing it's your there's even if if the the general audience can't tell that it's distortion they know there's something in it that's bugging them and that doesn't make it a pleasurable experience for them so it is it's it's the whole package it's that first impression it's that also you know first impression is if if it doesn't sound great, then the audience is going to think, well, this isn't really a good band. This is just some, you know, maybe local level band or whatever. They're not professional, you know, so yeah, it's, it's part it's of your brand. About, Very yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, for me as a musician, when I was, when we were talking earlier about how I was, you know, really squishing my mixes and making it so compressed and everything and um, not having very much like dynamic ability within each instrument, 
I remember I submitted something to a radio station and they wrote back and they're like, I like this song, but it's just not up to our, you know, our quality. And they gave me some other examples of people I could listen to. They're like, this is the type of thing we accept. And of course I was super bummed, but you know, I know you guys get these kinds of musicians get these kinds of things all the time and, and it can be upsetting and you can just like automatically be like, oh, they just don't understand. And, but, you know, why are they so picky and everything? But luckily I listened to that and I went and I listened back to the other musicians that they did accept. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I do hear the difference. And I right. do realize that I have to invest more in myself if I do want these songs to be, you know, placed and heard and everything. So I encourage all of you guys, um, you know, when you get those, that kinds of feedback, like don't be super reactive to it. Just try to take it um, constructively and think about how you can actually invest to improve because otherwise you're going to keep getting the same result if you keep creating the same mix. Yeah. And, and it's so important to, to, be objective about feedback. You know, sometimes people are just rude, but you know, a lot of times people are trying to help you. And, um, you know, there's sometimes there's just no way to do that without hurting your feelings because when it's something that you've created, your ego is involved and it's very hard to separate that from, you know, and, and be objective. So when someone's saying, Hey, you know, this is what you could do to improve it. Don't take that as a, as an insult, take it as, as great advice and, and, you know, and listen. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, is there anything we didn't cover today that you think is important for musicians to know about mixing an EQ? Well, you know, another thing is even if, if a musician doesn't want to do their own mixing, you know, knowing frequencies and, and EQ is important and really useful um, just for good communication. You know, if you're in a session with a producer and an engineer and, you know, you want to be able to speak the same language, you know, if the producer is saying, Hey, I think your guitar tone's a little heavy in six 30. Well, you want to know what that means rather than be like, um, okay, what does that mean? You know, um, 30 in the morning. What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, you know, and even, and if you're playing live gigs, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners, if they're gigging musicians, and many of them may have gotten into a situation to do a solo acoustic gig and they walk into a bar and the bartender said, well, here's the mixer. We don't have anybody to run this. So it's, it's oh. on you. And, and you're kind of like, oh, great. So now I have to play and mix my own sound. Um, and you could be sitting there, you know, dealing with feedback all night. Well, knowing frequencies and knowing how to EQ is how you get rid of that and how you have a great sounding show. Oh, that's um, such a good, that's such a good point about feedback. I mean, that's one of the super huge frustrations that I remember yeah. having is having to run our own sound and just not knowing how to get rid of that. Yeah. It's embarrassing when it happens. You know? Right. I mean, People, like leave the room. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, if you're the sound engineer, all eyes are on you. Like you might be invisible for the whole show, but the minute something feeds back, everybody knows where you are. And if, if you're a band mixing sound from the stage, it's, it, you know, it interrupts your performance. You can't really stop to fix it. And, you know, you can stop if you know exactly where to find it and what to do, but if you don't, you're scrambling. And, um, this is kind of another, another funny story about how this, this course came about. I, I was watching, I went to see a friend's band. They were just playing at a local pub and they were doing sound for themselves from the stage and having problems all through the first set, you know, like the vocals were muddy. You couldn't really understand them and they were feeding back. So after their first set, when they took a break, I said, Dave, you know, why don't you just do this, this, and this? And he looked at me like, I have no idea what any of that means. You know, and I was like, take out some 2.5 K and add a little this and do this. And and he, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm just turning knobs, you know, till I find something that works. And like, oh, no. <laughs> so, so that's what I kind of was just like, you know, I think there's maybe um, a need for this. Like, you know, it's, it's really not as hard as people think it is. And, and once they learn these simple techniques, it makes their, their lives so much better. You know, it makes their shows sound better. It makes their, their um, mixes sound better, their songs. Um, and, and especially if you're, you know, if you're, a uh, uh, indie musician recording your stuff in a home studio. How great does it feel when you can keep everything in house, when you don't have to hire someone to mix your songs. And when you know, like, I know how to get exactly what I want from this track, you know, and, and it's how much money does that save you when you realize that you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on plugins and, and gear, you know, you just need to learn how to EQ. It's, it's, you know, it saves you tons of time and money. 
Yeah, definitely time. I, I know all the times that I was trying to understand EQ and just messing with it. Like, okay, what happens when I change this frequency? You know, and it's like, I still never really got it. So right. uh, the, amount, the amount of time that could, could be saved, I think is really, really valuable because time really is money for all of us. Yeah. Well, yeah. this has been so awesome. I've loved gigging, you know, geeking out with you about all of this sound stuff. And I've learned a bunch actually. So I know our audience has. Um, where can our audience find out more about you and, and about your, you know, things that you teach and sound girls and all that stuff? They can find out more about me at mixingmusiclive.com. And actually I do have, um, which I, I'll give you the, the link for this. Um, there is, I have a free guide to the five biggest mistakes you're making with EQ, um, mm. that they can download and, and, you know, get a, a little quick overview of, of what they can be doing to improve their mixes. That's awesome. Cause I guarantee I made all of them. So I'm sure they are too. <laughs> That's great. And then soundgirls.org, right? Yep. Soundgirls.org. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really Thanks. appreciate you spending time and giving us all of this knowledge today. Thanks for having me, Brie. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.